A pro-statin doctor had written an article entitled, Why are we still in the middle of a statin war? Let's look at that and see if we can figure it out. Stay tuned. Even if you've never heard of the statin war, it's easy to imagine what it's about. It's the pro-statin advocates on one side and it's the statin hesitant or anti-statin advocates on the other side. This article here, why are we still in the middle of a statin war, really doesn't address that. It's more of a rhetorical headline. It's more of exasperation. We should have won this war. The doctor here restates the mainstream medical position on statins, but really doesn't ask the question, why is there a statin war? It's more of a mission is accomplished, let's declare victory and go home. Briefly, I just want to look at the motivations of those who are involved in it. First is the pharmaceutical industry. Their first duty is to their shareholders. It's not to consumer health. That's a distant second if it's even that high on the list. Pro statin research and doctors, I'm going to give them the benefit of a doubt. And I really think that they do want what is the best for the patients. They want to achieve this, however, by blanketing the population with statins to the maximum extent possible. So let's look at how they do that. Typically, the standards of care refer to a risk calculator, but the risk calculator they use is the 2013 pooled cohort equation risk calculator. That is the one that the standards of care refer to, even though there's a 2018 version that gives a much lower value, also known to be more accurate. They ask a few questions, uh, demographics, race, gender, and age, total cholesterol and HDL is the only cholesterol values, and then they ask for systolic blood pressure, whether you smoke and whether you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes is typically what they're referring to there. Out of all of these, these last three, the blood pressure, the smoking, and the type 2 diabetes are higher risk factors than cholesterol is. What they don't ask about, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, coronary artery calcium score, parotid intima media thickness test, LP little a measurements, triglycerides. I haven't found any calculators that mention triglycerides, and that just baffles me. LDL fractionation or remnant cholesterol. These are all known to be risk factors. Some of the calculators do reference some of these values but none of them look into all of them. Risk values from the various different risk calculators that do use some of these vary all over the place. Let's look at a quote from a paper that I'm actually going to get into more detail later, where one of the statin advocates pointed this out. Looking at what happened to 28,266 people who reported an adverse reaction, 70.7% continue to receive statins, and after four years, cardiovascular events in the treated group was 12.2%, and those who didn't take the prescription had a higher percentage, 13.9%. That's not really that much of a difference. I put these numbers into a statistical calculator just to see what they would tell us. By the way, there were 2,438 events among those who continue to use statins. There were 1,151 one among those who discontinued statins, but those who discontinued statins was a smaller group, it was only 29.3% of the entire groups. We can't just look at those two numbers and say, well, statins actually caused more harm than they prevented. But just so you know what figures we're dealing with, that was also a four-year risk. And that's actually a very high risk. 14% in four years is extremely high. I extrapolated it to 10 years because that's what I like to talk about, 10-year risks. And I did a simple extrapolation. I just multiplied the events by two and a half. That's not exactly the way to do it, but it's close enough for what's just really an estimate. So you can see that in 10 years, the risk reduction grew to about 4.3%. That's the absolute risk reduction. The relative risk reduction, though, is still 12.2%. And that's about a third of what's typically claimed, for example, in this famous Lipitor ad, that they reduce heart attacks by 30 you could make a case looking at this data that statins are that much less effective for people who experience adverse effects or perhaps for people who are at very high risk. So these are the figures that they're throwing at us. This brings us to what is really the problem here, and it's difference in ideology. It's not difference in the science as much, though we disagree on the science to some degree. But the difference is in ideology. Statins are studied on populations, but they're used to treat individuals. You notice the number needed to treat even after 10 years for this very high risk group was 24, meaning that you'd have to treat 24 people for 10 years to save one of them. Those kinds of numbers needed to treat just don't help individuals. Adverse effects truly degrade quality of life for individuals, and we can't ignore that for the greater good. We're gonna put 24 people on a statin for 10 years, eight 
eight of them are going to have quality of life degrading adverse effects and one of them is going to be saved it might not be one of those people even put up with the adverse effects we just don't know in this case because we can't go back in time and rerun the experiment that is the main ideological problem between the two camps as I'll call it. The second differences in our ideology is that statins treat a measurement rather than addressing metabolic dysfunction. And if you remember the risk calculator that I showed, even the prostatin side acknowledges by way of the risk calculator that insulin resistance as reflected in type 2 diabetes, and by the way, you'll notice that calculator, they ask a very simple question. It's a yes, no. Diabetes is much more complicated than that. Assuming a person who's really concerned about the metabolic health and their heart risk is not smoking, the top two factors are insulin resistance that's reflected in type 2 diabetes and blood pressure. Statins address only the symptom of one of what they maintain as a risk factor, a risk factor that's very low on the scale, and that is cholesterol levels. Problem is the cholesterol level risk factor has got so many different things in it. I would agree that yes, if you have oxidized LDL, you have very low HDL, you have very high triglycerides, then yes, that's an indicator at the very least of risk. But what they do is they treat the measurement instead of addressing metabolic dysfunction, which is really at the heart of most cardiovascular risk, barring genetic conditions and that sort of thing. Third difference in ideology is that drugs are emphasized over lifestyle changes. Now, lifestyle is not easily addressed by primary care physicians, and let's face it, the average patient, at least in the Western world, really isn't thrilled about undergoing lifestyle changes. Those of us who are statin hesitant and are serious about it really do look at lifestyle as the best treatment, at least if you start it early enough, to reduce cardiovascular risk. There was another paper and the title of it was Statin Denialism is a Deadly Internet Driven Cult. This is an example of an ad hominem attack and as any historian will tell you if you're looking at evidence about a war the description of one side's positions is not best left up to the other side to state. For example we'll see here Dr. Nissen says the anti-statin forces employ two distinct strategies. Statin denial the proposition that cholesterol is not related to heart disease. Okay, some of the statin hesitant and anti-statin forces do make that argument. And statin fear, the notion that lowering serum cholesterol levels will cause serious adverse effects. Well, actually, I do believe that that's the case, but that's not the only case of serious adverse effects. CoQ10 is lowered by statins, and that can cause adverse effects that are somewhat independent of the lowering of cholesterol. I mean, the two cholesterol and CoQ10 are lowered together because they're created along the same chemical pathways, but the adverse adverse effects from lowered CoQ10 are in that sense independent of the adverse effects from lowered cholesterol. The adverse effects from lowered cholesterol are probably the mental ones, the brain fog, that sort of thing. But also the muscular effects, they have little to do with the lowering of cholesterol. That's because the statin medications are getting into organs and muscles and systems within our body where they weren't intended to go, but that's just the collateral damage that our bodies take by taking statins. This article here was basically just an attack probably written in frustration because I'm sure Dr. Nissen truly believes that statins are wonder drugs and everybody should be taking them despite the lack of any meaningful effectiveness for most of us. So what should you do when you're dealing with your primary care physician? Remember that you're an individual and not a population and you should demand that your doctor treat you as an individual. So when they throw population statistics at you, ask the probing questions. Well, what's my risk? If my risk is 11%, then what's my risk reduction? If they tell you it's anything more than 4% will be charitable and say they just don't understand the statistics. So if you did happen to get a reduction of 4% from an 11% 10-year risk, how many of us would need to be treated? Well, in that case, it's 25. Your individual numbers will vary. In my case, my risk is typically measured around 5%, yet because of the LDL numbers, doctors are always talking to me about statins, and I just say, no, I'm not going to take them. And you can argue that regardless of what the medical profession panel of experts says is a risk that's too high to bear at seven and a half percent which is what the standards of care say that's not a scientific fact that's a medical opinion I always turn it around and say well there's a 92 and a half percent chance that I'm not going to have a heart attack a statin is only going to change that by a little bit it's going to move the marker just a tiny bit if we're lucky but the chances are overwhelming at least in my case because I'm statin intolerant that I'm going to have adverse effects from it the second issue the core issue is metabolic dysfunction not a statin deficiency so ask your doctor to help you address metabolic issues. I have a considerable amount of insulin 
insulin resistance from 62 years of being a sugar addict before I kicked that habit and figured out what was going on. No doctor ever really discussed that with me and made the connection between insulin resistance and heart risk. And finally, lifestyle beats drugs when addressed early enough in a person's life. So find a doctor who thinks lifestyle before prescription. If they look at one and maybe perhaps your first, like in last week's video, my friend Dan, his one and only cholesterol panel and they're already talking to him about statins instead of talking about what are the causes, instead of drilling deeper and understanding it. Find a doctor who thinks lifestyle before prescription. That's going to be very hard, by the way, because with your standard primary care physician who meets you for once or twice a year for a 20-minute extended visit, it's going to be a tough one to do. Here are my closing thoughts on this statin war that we're still in. Those of us who are leaning towards statin hesitant positions or anti-statin positions, we're not anti-science and we're not a cult. We don't eat babies for breakfast. The provocative article title about an internet-driven death cult, that was just an ad hominem attack. What we want is good information and we want effective treatments. And most of us believe that the effective treatments are going to be lifestyle-based, at least to start. This article accused the anti-statin side of trying to sell fear and to sell supplements. That's not the case. There are a lot of well-respected doctors who are questioning the whole use of statins to control cholesterol as a way of reducing cardiovascular risk. The people whose names we see coming up over and over again are well-credentialed researchers and practicing physicians. The bottom line is that the statin wars are not about science. They're about ideology. So that's my opinion on this subject. If you appreciate this content, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on this topics or others you'd like me to cover. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.